Hi everyone. Uh, I'm very glad that we have Glenn Branch back with us. He was one of our first speakers when we first got started, and it turns out that there's still a lot of problems with intelligent design, creationism, uh, and uh, the teaching of evolution. And uh, his organization was very involved in the Kitzmiller case, which Americans United was also involved with. So without further ado, here is Glenn Branch. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Steph. Uh, as you may have heard, my name is Glenn Branch, and I'm the deputy director at the National Center for Science Education. In nonprofits, deputy director uh, equates to something like utility infielder. So uh, NCSC is a small nonprofit organization headquartered in the Bay Area, uh, and perhaps best known for its work in defending the teaching of evolution in the public schools. Indeed, NCSC is so focused on the creationism evolution debate that we joke around the office that we're an inch, um, that we're an inch wide and a mile deep. Uh, that's not the office, that's the lava falls and Grand Canyon as seen from the Toro Weep Outlook. Uh, I can't make that joke anymore, even though I just did, because at the beginning of 2012, we added another issue to our portfolio. We're also defending the teaching of climate science in the classrooms, meaning now the joke is that we're two inches wide and a mile deep. <laughs> but I'm going to be talking about the creationism evolution controversy today. And in that controversy, NCSC's primary role is to provide assistance, support, and advice to parents, teachers, students, anyone facing challenges to evolution education in their local communities or in their states. That's why NCSC, as we say, serves as a kind of crisis clinic. That's the office there. <laughs> now, I should say a word about the intentionally cryptic title of my uh, talk today. After Kitzmiller, what? I model this on the title of a book by the American humorist Robert Benchley, seen here showing his legendary knowledge of the human digestive system. Uh, Benchley, by the way, was the grandfather of Peter Benchley, who wrote the bestseller Jaws. Uh, his grandfather had a better way with titles, though. Uh, he once published a book with the title, After 1903, What? <laughs> now, clearly, that's a great title for a book of punditry to publish in, say, late 1903 or early 1904 to address the burning issues of the day. Benchley, for his part, published this book in 1938, <laughs> by which time it must have been pretty easy to foresee the trends afflicting 1903. <laughs> Now, I'm in a similar position talking about Kitzmiller, which, not to beat about the bush, was a trial conducted in 2005, and here it is, 2014 already. But as I'm going to contend, the Kitzmiller case was interestingly pivotal in the history of the anti-evolution movement in the United States as marking the end of the second phase of anti-evolution activity and the beginning of the third phase. That's not very surprising, actually, because the history of the anti-evolution movement in the United States has largely been driven by legal developments. If I had enough time, of course, we'd start all the way back with Darwin, who many people don't realize was a pseudonym of Alfred Russell Wallace. No, seriously. Um, <laughs> it's just that this was such a bad mistake at a publisher's art department, putting a picture of Alfred Russell Wallace on the cover of an edition of Charles Darwin's autobiography that I like to rub it in whenever I can. <laughs> Anyhow, so we're going to skip right over Darwin and the reception of evolution and go straight to when the creationist movement in the United States really commenced, the aftermath of the First World War. Well, why then? There are three reasons why anti-evolutionism started getting going in the wake of World War I. The first is the association of evolution with German militarism, which led to the horrors of World War I trench warfare. This is a photograph from the Battle of the Somme. Second, the revival of evangelical Christianity in the form of fundamentalism as introduced in a series of pamphlets. You see here uh, the fundamentals originally issued between 1910 and 1915. And third, the broadening of American public education. For the first time, students, particularly in rural areas, were being exposed to more than just reading, writing, and arithmetic with books like Hunter's Civic Biology, which featured the concept of evolution. This is a relevant page from the 1914 edition. <clears throat> As a result, the first wave of anti-evolutionism involved a crusade to ban the teaching of evolution in American public schools. 
It was well underway in the 1920s under the auspices of William Jennings Bryan. As is familiar, uh, the ACLU recruited Tom, John Thomas Scopes to serve as the defendant in a test case in Dayton, Tennessee. Scopes was convicted, to nobody's surprise. His conviction was overturned on appeal, and the state declined to prosecute him again, especially since he had left the state by then. Nevertheless, despite the fact that the creationists had taken a hammering, especially from big city journalists during the trial, despite the fact that their champion Brian died about five days after the trial, creationists really came out the winners from the Scopes trial. And that's because evolution went into abeyance, educationally speaking, after the Scopes trial. Fearing controversy, textbook publishers downplayed evolution in their textbooks, teachers followed suit, and it wasn't until the 1960s when evolution was re-entering the curriculum that the creationism evolution controversy resurfaced in earnest. Susan Epperson was a high school teacher in Arkansas who was asked by the Arkansas Education Association to be the plaintiff in a case challenging the state's ban on <coughs> teaching evolution, which had been enacted by initiative back in the 1920s. The text that she had been asked to use, which she's holding in that picture there, was the descendant of a textbook that had been stripped of evolution after the Scopes trial, but had had it put back in again shortly before she started teaching. That put the book in conflict with the law. That put Epperson in conflict with the law because that was the book her school told her to be teaching from. Epperson asserted that the statute violated her constitutional rights. The case wound its way to the Supreme Court, which made short work of it in 1968. So with evolution back in the textbooks, and with legal barriers to its teaching being removed or falling under legal challenge, the stage was set for the second stage of anti-evolution activity, in which it no longer being possible to ban evolution, you know, I pressed the wrong button there, here we go. Uh, the creationists attempted to balance evolution. With what? Well, in the first instance, with the Bible. Now, the fellow on the left there is Russell Artist. He was born in 1911, died in 2000, so I think we can infer that that's a portrait of Artist as a young man. <laughs> you, you, can re you can rejoice in a pun like that. Okay. So, Artist uh, wasn't a Joyce Scholar, no. He was a biology professor at a, a Churches of Christ school, Daniel Lipscomb College, now Lipscomb University in Nashville. He was also a member of something called the Creation Research Society, and he co-authored the creationist textbook, Biology, A Search for Order and Complexity. But the artist was frustrated that the Tennessee Textbook Commission wouldn't adopt this text for use in the state's public schools. As a result, thanks to artists' urging, in 1973, the state of Tennessee passed a bill requiring that biology textbooks that discuss evolution also, and I quote, give in the same textbook and under the same subject, commensurate attention to and an equal amount of emphasis on the origins and creations of man and his world as the same as recorded in other theories, including, but not limited to, the Genesis account of the Bible. Now, the Tennessee law was swiftly challenged in both state and federal court, making the legal history a bit of a mess. But the federal court ruled that this statute was patently unconstitutional in a case called Daniel v. Waters in 1975. Uh, Daniel is that fellow there who was a zoology professor at the University of Tennessee. Waters was the chair of the textbook commission. Now the federal court struck down the law as unconstitutional, both because it gave a preferential position to the biblical view of creation and, get this, because it explicitly provided that satanic theories weren't protected. So, Back to the drawing board for the creationists. In the second instance then, creationists attempted to balance evolution with something called creation science. Here's the grand old man of creation science, Henry M. Morris, and here's a textbook that he compiled, Scientific Creationism. Now, Morris accepted Genesis as a historical account without error, and he considered himself to be a biblical creationist, but it wasn't the Bible that he wanted taught in the public schools. Rather, he wanted creation science, or scientific creationism, as it was often called, to be taught. So what is creation science? In content, it's probably what you think of when you think of creationism. The main claims are that the universe and the earth are young, 6,000 years old, maybe at a stretch 10,000 years old, 
that living things were specially created by God to reproduce after their own kind, which means no evolution across kinds, that Noah's flood was a historical worldwide event responsible for the fossil record and for major geological features like the Grand Canyon. Two things to bear in mind though. One is uh, creation science isn't the only form of creationism available. Historically, maintaining that the earth is young is not a very traditional view in, as a response to modern geology in Christianity. In the 1820s or so, there were a bunch of people who thought that. In 1920, in the Scopes era, there was a fellow named George McCready Price who thought so. But it wasn't until the publication of the Genesis Flood by John C. Whitcomb Jr. and Henry M. Morris, which you see there on the right, that it began to make inroads and it's now possibly the dominant creationist position in uh, the United States. But now and before, and no doubt into the future, there have been other forms of creationism out there. Uh, second, there is, as you might have noticed, a bit of a resemblance between the claims of scientific creationism or creation science and a particular reading of Genesis 1 through 11. But Morris and other creation scientists claim that, you know, we're not trying to teach the Bible. This all has a perfectly good secular scientific basis. So how did that work out for them? Well, there were dozens of laws proposing equal time for scientific creationism introduced in legislatures around the country in the 70s and 80s. And two of these were passed, both in 1981, one in Arkansas, one in Louisiana. The Arkansas law was promptly challenged in a landmark trial, McLean versus Arkansas in 1982. One reason that McLean was a landmark case is because there was testimony from expert witnesses. Now this was a real novelty. There had, the judge in the Scopes case hadn't allowed expert testimony. But all of a sudden you had a stellar legal team for the plaintiffs bringing in expert witnesses like Francisco Ayala, who's uh, now down at Irvine by the way, uh, Brent Dalrymple, Stephen Jay Gould. And their efforts were repaid. The judge struck down the laws unconstitutional. So devastating was the defeat that the state decided not to appeal the verdict to the federal district court. Fundamentalist leaders like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson bitterly complained that the Arkansas Attorney General had thrown the case to the evolutionists. So, so much for Arkansas. The Louisiana bill, however, eventually reached the Supreme Court. Now, before I say what the court held in that case, an often overlooked aspect of the Louisiana legislation deserves your attention. Both of the bills in Arkansas and Louisiana started off pretty much the same. They were based on the same model bill uh, developed by a fellow named Paul Elwanger, who based his model bill on a model school board policy uh, drafted by the Institution, Institute for Creation Research. The model bill and Arkansas's bill both defined creation science rather specifically. On the left, I'm not going to read it all, but you can see it talks about creation ex nihilo, it talks about evolution only within kinds, it talks about a young earth. But Louisiana's bill, as passed by the legislature, defined creation science as constituting the scientific evidences for creation and inferences from those scientific evidences, and that's it. Whatever that's supposed to mean. So why the sudden reticence in Louisiana to say what it is that they were demanding equal time for? Well, the day on which the references to the age of the earth and the global flood and all those, that good stuff, all, the day on which that material was stripped by the legislature from the bill then under consideration, May 28, 1981, was the day after McLean versus Arkansas was filed in court. The day after. Well, as you know, correlation does not imply causality, as this webcomic uh, informs us. And there's the punchline at the Creation Science Labs. Anyhow, so it didn't help. In Louisiana, the case was Edwards v. Aguilard, and the creationists lost that one too. That's the lead plaintiff there, Don Aguilard, and the orange garment to the left, which I cropped out, is being worn by none other than Susan Epperson. Now, the Louisiana law, as I've just shown, watered down the meaning of creation science in an attempt to make the law constitutional. So when that law was found unconstitutional, the damage to the creationist cause was much, much greater. 
The Supreme Court's decision doesn't say that teaching creation science doesn't, is unconstitutional. It doesn't say teaching worldwide flood is unconstitutional. It says the act impermissibly endorses religion by advancing the religious belief that a supernatural being created humankind. That's a much broader ruling. But still, even in the wake of that ruling, the idea still beckoned of further disinfecting creationism of its overtly religious content. Such innovations as abrupt appearance theory and initial appearance theory swiftly came and went, but the version with the most staying power was something called intelligent design, the de facto institutional headquarters of which has uh, emerged as the Discovery Institute. And here are the chief scientific voice of intelligent design, Michael Behe, a biochemistry professor at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, and the intelligent design textbook of pandas and people. Now, intelligent design fundamentally is about finding something that can be billed as a scientific alternative to evolution that will survive constitutional scrutiny. Unlike most scientific theories, you have to have a law book to work it out. So, consequently, intelligent design proponents deny that their view entails any particular conception about the designer. It could be God, they say, but it could be intelligent extraterrestrials or time-traveling cell biologists from the far future. I am not making this up. <laughs> For similar reasons, in reasons, intelligent design strives to uphold a big tent under which all anti-evolutionists are welcome to shelter. And that includes young earth creationists, old earth creationists, ultra-orthodox Jewish creationists, Islamic creationists, Hare Krishna creationists, about the only anti-evolution group apparently unwelcome under the big tent is a clone crazed alien worshiping free love UFO cult, the Ray Aliens, whose public support of teaching intelligent design in the public schools was met with a stony silence. <laughs> Thus, although individual proponents of intelligent design often have opinions of such issues as the nature of the designer in the age of the earth, the central message of intelligent design is that somewhere, at some point in time, some intelligent agent somehow did something, for some reason, to affect the history of life, somehow. <laughs> now, most students in public school classes can fill in the dots. They'll have notions about where, what, who, how, what, why, and when, and the intended and likely upshot of teaching intelligent design as a scientifically credible idea in the public school science classes is clear. And make no mistake about it, the target is public school classes. Of Pandas and People, shown here, is the first book to use the phrase intelligent design in this particular sense, and it was intended for use as a supplementary textbook in public schools. So the big fight over intelligent design public schools occurred here, there, in Dover, Pennsylvania. In Dover, in 2004, the school board's attempts to get equal time for creationism in the curriculum mutated, eventually, into a theory that said students will be made aware of gaps slash problems in Darwin's theory and of other theories of evolution, including but not limited to intelligent design. This policy was then implemented in a requirement that teachers read a four-paragraph disclaimer about intelligent design and evolution. I'll provide that disclaimer in a free translation. The uh, first paragraph said essentially, uh, sorry, they're making us teach evolution. While the second paragraph reassured the audience that evolution is just a theory full of holes. I'll return to that notion. The third paragraph, there's not going to be a test on this. The, the third paragraph recommended intelligent design as an alternative explanation of the origin of life and pointed students to that very book of pandas and people, of which more in a moment. And the final paragraph said that discussions of the origins of life were left to students and their family and, of course, reminded them that they were being forced to teach evolution. Now, Of Pandas and People was a surprising choice of a textbook. Published first in 1989 and then in a second edition in 1993, it was thus over 10 years old by the time it was being recommended in the Dover Public Schools, which is a very long time by the standards of American school textbooks. Fortunately, there were enough copies to go around, since as yet anonymous citizens had donated no fewer than 60 copies to the school. Uh, 60, good. <laughs> no surprise then, 
that 11 local parents filed suit, represented by the ACLU of Pennsylvania, the private Philadelphia law firm Pepper Hamilton, and Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which is why you should support AU and their local chapters, by the way. <laughs> the uh, case was called uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover. Uh, there were 11 plaintiffs. The plaintiff's legal team decided to have Tammy Kitzmiller as the lead plaintiff, and I had talked to them, and the, the explanation for this was, in part, because she had a child in ninth grade uh, biology, so she would have this disclaimer read to her, and also they thought they liked her name. They thought it was a good old um, euphonious Pennsylvania Dutch surname, Kitzmiller. Kitzmiller. <laughs> looks, also looks good in headlines. So. In these photos from a press conference announcing the filing of the lawsuit, we see first the lead attorney for the parents, that's Eric Rothschild of Pepper Hamilton, and I think you recognize that textbook, he's waving. Barry Lynn, Executive Director of Americans United, then as now. And a Penn State anthropologist, that's Bob Eckhart for you uh, paleoanthro buffs, explaining the scientific, uh, scientific status of evolution with the assistance of the loyal opposition wearing a funny hat. <laughs> Now, who was representing the board then? Not their regular solicitor who advised them against adopting this policy. Instead, writing to the rescue, it was the Thomas More Law Center, named after a Catholic saint, funded by the ultra-right Catholic pizza millionaire Tom Monahan, and headed by Dick Thompson, who was the Oakland County, Michigan prosecutor so avid in prosecuting the right to die activist Jack Borkian that the voters decided that he didn't need to do it anymore on the public payroll. Um, uh, Thomas More styles itself the sword and shield for people of faith. Did I mention that they need to be arguing at this point that the anti-evolution policy doesn't have any religious relevance? Um, that's sort of easy to lose sight of sometimes. It turned out later that Thomas More had been shopping around. They had been looking for a school district that would be willing to be the test case over the teaching of intelligent design, and here it was. Now, the suit was filed in December 2004. And that left very little time before the first time that this four paragraph disclaimer would be read to school children. After conducting preliminary depositions, the plaintiff's legal team decided not to seek a preliminary injunction against the ruling of that um, disclaimer. And that put the Dover teachers actually in a bind. They had been pretty quiet so far because they didn't want to get in the middle of it. They have a job to do and they don't need to be dragged into a public controversy. But now it looked like they were going to be forced to read the statement. They very courageously issued a statement of their own saying that reading the statement violates their responsibilities as public educators, saying that they have a duty to tell the truth, and that if they read the statement, they will not be telling the truth. And really this is commendable for them to be taking a stand. Um, they actually had one of, one of the, among their number was close to retirement age and had expressed her willingness to be fired over this, but the rest of them weren't. And it's worth keeping in mind that teachers are not always in a position to make uh, big, bold, courageous statements. John Scopes was the defendant in the Scopes case because he, he wasn't the regular biology teacher. He was a short timer. He was there teaching school for a year in between college and graduate school so he could save up some money. Scopes. Anyhow. The administration decided not to push the point, and in fact, it was administrators, the school superintendent as deputy, who read the statement instead. And if the Dover kids held their school administrators in the same high esteem I did when I was in school, <laughs> they probably didn't pay a lot of attention. <laughs> but the trial continues. So the legal team began to line up their expert witnesses. The Thomas More Center, presumably working with the Discovery Institute, named named the two powerhouses of intelligent design, Michael Behe, who we saw before, and uh, William Dembski, a fellow with PhDs in both mathematics and philosophy, and now working as a uh, professor of theology. Bulking up the scientists was a microbiologist from uh, Idaho State, Scott Minnick, a sociology professor from the University of Warwick, Steve Fuller, a rhetoric professor from the University of Memphis, John Angus Campbell, philosophy professor from the University of North Carolina, Warren Nord, a fellow who had previously argued in print for imbuing the whole curriculum with religion, even mathematics. 
uh, an education professor from the University of Colorado named Dick Carpenter, whose main claim to fame was working as an educational analyst for Focus on the Family. And finally, as a rebuttal witness, Stephen C. Meyer, the um, director of the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. An impressive bunch, um, perhaps the unin uninitiated, but many of them had a long history of intelligent design advocacy and a long paper trail that the plaintiff's legal team would be scrutinizing for damaging uh, admissions. I had done this myself with um, Campbell at great length. Meanwhile, the plaintiff's legal team, with NCSE's guidance, was picking its own experts. Uh, Kenneth Miller, a cell biologist from Brown University, Kevin Padian, a paleontologist from Berkeley, and at the time, the president of NCSE's board of directors, uh, Robert Pennock, a philosopher of science from Michigan State, uh, Barbara Forrest, a philosopher from Southeastern Louisiana University, and another member of NCSE's board of directors, uh, Jack Hott, a Catholic theologian from Georgetown University, Brian Alters, then a professor of education at McGill, now at Chapman, just down the road, also a member of NCSE's board of directors, perhaps you see a pattern emerging. And as a rebuttal witness to Dembski, a University of Waterloo computer science professor named uh, Jeffrey Shallot. Now you may be thinking that's a very cluttered PowerPoint page and a very cluttered arrangement of uh, witnesses. True enough, but this was the first creationism case to come down the pike in a long time. Both sides wanted to give it their best shot and put on their best people. Really, uh, McLean versus Arkansas is the only case to rival it, and anyhow, we'll get rid of some of these people shortly. On the very day that John Angus Campbell was scheduled to be deposed in Memphis, he withdrew from the case. Did we lose him? There we go. Much to the annoyance of the plaintiff's lawyers who had prepared for the deposition and traveled to Memphis. All for nothing. And then William Dembski was removed as a witness too. What was going on? There have been self-serving accounts um, from both sides, but essentially it seems that the Discovery Institute was trying to throw its weight around to run the case to suit itself. Thomas More balked at that. As part of that, Campbell and Dembski wanted to have their own Discovery Institute furnished lawyers at their depositions, a very unusual circumstance for a deposition. By the time Meyer's deposition came around, uh, Thomas More was willing to let him have his own lawyer present, but too late, the rift was already too wide, and Meyer refused to be deposed. As a consequence of Dempsey's pull pulling out of the case, the rebuttal witness, Jeff Shallot, then became irrelevant, although he was ready to testify if any of the other witnesses had invoked Dempsey's uh, work. The next sign of strife between Thomas More and Discovery Institute was when the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, a little ministry down in Texas, sought to intervene in the case. Foundation for Thought and Ethics was the publisher of, of Pandas and People. It had close ties to the Discovery Institute and it had already been brought into the case because the plaintiff's legal team, with prompting from NCSE, had subpoenaed its files, looking for drafts of the book that would become of Pandas and People, as well as for drafts of its proposed third edition to be re-entitled uh, The Design of Life. Um, so FTE sought to intervene in the case and wanted and petitioned to be added to the lawsuit as a co-defendant, citing, among other things, the possibility of financial loss if intelligent design were to be ruled unconstitutional to teach in the public schools. Unfortunately, uh, FTE's president, John Buell, did not acquit himself very well on this matter during oral arguments. He told the court, for example, that FTE was not at all a religious organization, prompting Eric Rothschild to produce a tax return. Oops, wrong way. Are you going back and forth? There we are. A tax return on which FTE described as its primary purpose promoting and publishing textbooks presenting a Christian perspective. Rothschild also showed the court FD's Articles of Incorporation, which cite, among its purposes, making known the Christian gospel and understanding of the Bible. And yet, Buell had told the court that FD was not at all a religious organization. Hmm. Buell had an explanation. His accountant and his lawyer were responsible. <laughs> oh. So the judge ruled that FD, the Foundation for Thought and Ethics was not entitled to intervene in the case uh, among other things, because its motion to intervene was not timely, but also described Buell's excuses for not trying to become involved in the case earlier as both unavailing, unavailing and disingenuous. 
So the trial was set to go ahead, and it did, starting in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, on September 26. Now, presiding over the case was Judge John E. Jones III. Appointed to the bench by President George W. Bush, uh, Jones was a player in the state Republican machine, a protege of Tom Ridges, a would-be congressman who thought of running for governor, and a former commissioner of the state liquor board, where he enjoyed two short bursts of fame, one for a failed attempt to privatize the state liquor board stores, and another for a ban on bad frog beer, on whose logo the titular amphibian is slipping the middle finger. <laughs> Jones had a uh, good reputation as an eminently fair judge, though, and both sides seemed content with him. This was vitally important since this case was a bench trial, meaning there was no jury. Now, there were six um, weeks of trial, as the judge quipped at the, the final day, 40 days and 40 nights. And I obviously can't tell you everything that happened, but here are three high points. The first involves Barbara Forrest, the philosophy professor testifying for the plaintiffs. Now, she testified as an expert on the history of the intelligent design movement, about which she and the biologist Paul R. Gross had written an excellent book called Creationism's Trojan Horse, shown here, which meticulously charts the course and reveals the religious underpinnings of intelligent design. Now, the defense was desperate for her not to testify and filed a number of pretrial motions in order to get her disqualified. Judge Jones said, basically, well, let's see what she says. The defense then spent an entire morning in open court trying to have her testimony excluding, excluded, accusing her of atheism, conspiracy, theori theorizing, and having no relevant credentials. Uh, they were correct about the atheism as it happens, but the judge let her testify. And it was a doozy. Forrest had done her homework, aided by the material that had come from e the Foundation for Thought and Ethics on subpoena and from NCC's own archives, and she found a lot of materials that showed the creationist roots of both pandas and people. One of her results was charting the occurrence of creationism and its cognates, the red, versus the occurrences of intelligent design, the blue, in the various drafts of both pandas and people. As you see, something happened in the middle of 1987, where the lines cross. That's when creationism comes out and intelligent design goes in. And that happens right around when the Ad Edwards v. Aguilar decision is handed down by the Supreme Court, after which a textbook that explicitly mentioned creationism would be in serious constitutional trouble. Someone was obviously anticipating such trouble. Forrest even managed to locate a perfect transitional form, whereas a draft of the book said, evolutionists think the former is correct, creationists accept the latter view, and the published version of the book said, evolutionists think the former is correct, design proponents accept the latter view. An intermediate draft said, evolutionists think the former is correct, see design proponents accept the <laughs> latter view. That's what comes between creationists and design proponents, obviously. The second interesting thing to happen during the trial was that the defense lost two more of its experts, deciding not to call Warren Nord, goodbye Warren, and Dick Carpenter, goodbye Dick, after all. Carpenter later wrote an article for School Board magazine about his experiences that was a witness in this trial in which he was not called, which I think took some chutzpah. <laughs> so starting with seven experts and a rebuttal expert, they were down to only three, Beatty, Minnick, and Fuller. NCSC, for some reason, wasn't privy to what was going on on the other side, but it seems that the defense was in a state of disarray. They brought it on themselves. They'd been trying to engineer a test case for years, and now they got one. It was clear they weren't prepared to do it right. And it didn't help that their star witnesses, Behe and Fuller, were both drawn on the stand into making some fairly silly claims. Behe, for example, said that intelligent design was a scientific theory in exactly the same sense astrology is. Astronomy, <laughs> astrology. <laughs> and Fuller, the sociologist, said that he thought that it was worthwhile to teach intelligent design in science classes as a way of providing affirmative action to fringe theories. Not quite the uncompromising affirmation of intelligent design as science that we might have hoped to see, but of course both men were under oath. The third thing, interesting, that happened was the testimony of the school board members, particularly William Buckingham and his crony Alan Monsell. This is Alan Monsell, looking happy as he's being interviewed by reporters. He wasn't so happy on the stand. 
<laughs> undergoing a undergoing a grueling cross-examination about the source of the money for those 60 copies of the families and people that I showed you. It turned out that this money was collected from the parishioners at Monsell's own church, and that he was less than forthcoming about this during his deposition. He said, I have never brought anything forward but creationism in the school district in any shape or form, despite the fact that evidence had already been presented in that same courtroom that he had. The normally equable Judge Jones took over the questioning of Monsell himself and pointedly reminded him that he was under oath. Uh, let's see. Judge Jones is a... Uh made some noises after the trial about investigating um, the possibility of fi par filing perjury charges against Bonsall, but nothing came of it. So. As for Buckingham, he told the court that he, I have a picture of Buckingham somewhere, there we are. He told the court that he had never said anything suggesting that he wanted creationism to be taught in Dover schools, despite newspaper reports saying that he had defended the policy by saying, 2,000 years ago, someone died on a cross. Can't someone take a stand for him? So, but, you know, he denied it. He said that the newspaper reporters had made it up to sell newspapers in rural South Central Pennsylvania. Um, so the plaintiff's legal team introduced evidence. Not an eyewitness, no. Not a written document, no. A videotape of Buckingham saying that he wanted to balance evolution in the classroom with something else, quote, such as creationism, end quote. Videotape. Oops. Uh, he tried what a local reporter characterized as the Homer Simpson defense at this point. He was thinking, don't say creationism, don't say creationism, don't say creationism. <laughs> and then he opens his yap and says creationism. <laughs> now, the trial started in September and wrapped up in early November, and you know what early November is, election season. When the school board voted to adopt the anti-evolution policy, it passed by a vote for six to three. Two of those three resigned in protest, a third because he was moving out of town anyhow, a fourth later resigned because of the lawsuit. Before the election, uh, their replacements were appointed by the remaining members of the board pending the next election, and so you had a board that was consisted only of supporters of the policy. Then in November, eight of the nine board members were up for re-election, and intelligent design was, as you see, a big campaign issue. Well, a local editorial cartoonist explained what happened. All eight incumbents lost. <laughs> but, the trial was not mooted by the election for a variety of reasons, so the judge continued to deliberate. And then on October 20th it came. The uh, anniversary has been dubbed Kitsmas. <laughs> it was, as you see, a complete victory. So was intelligent design through? Well, in Dover, the new board decided not to appeal the decision. So the decision is directly precedential only in the middle federal district of Pennsylvania. It's a stunningly well wrought a decision though, and like the decision in McLean versus Arkansas before it, it's sure to be greatly influential in any further cases. Moreover, the reputation of intelligent design suffered greatly as a result of this case. In 2006, legislators in Indiana and Utah abandoned their proposed bills to require the teaching of intelligent, intelligent design, and the Ohio State Board of Education rescinded a controversial intelligent design friendly po lesson plan. Not everybody got the message, of course. For example, there was an equal time for intelligent design bill introduced in 2012 in the Missouri House of Representatives. As evolution bills goes, it's pretty much do lally. The text is about 3,000 words long, beginning with a defectively alphabetized glossary of terms like analogous naturalistic processes and destiny and scientific law. But the take home message, as you see here, was an equal time for intelligent design. Rick Bratton, was the, who I believe is a drywaller by trade, uh, was the lead sponsor uh, that year. A version of this bill gets introduced every few years at the, same, at the behest of the same creationist, a fellow living in St. Charles, Missouri. Uh, so far, it never makes it as far as a floor vote. This particular instance of it died in committee. But even wackier bills have been known to make, made it, make it further. Consider, Indiana Senate Bill 89 from the same year. As introduced by Dennis Cruz, uh, this bill would have authorized local school districts to require the teaching, not even of intelligent design, but of creation science. 
which the uh, Supreme Court had addressed pretty conclusively back in 1987. Now, a state legislature can't authorize local school districts to violate the U.S. Constitution. That's not how it works. Uh, that didn't seem to bo bother Cruz, and it didn't seem to bother the Senate committee, which passed the bill 8-2, to two, sending it to the Senate floor. In the Senate, however, um, my personal hero, Vi Simpson, introduced what was a poison pill amendment, saying that she changed it so that local school districts could teach various theories of the origins of life from multiple religions, which may include, among others, Scientology. Since Scientology is regarded by many as a nutty and dangerous cult with funny ideas about volcanoes and clams and operating thetans and whatnot, this was something of a coup. Uh, the, still, the bill might have done mischief if, if it had passed, but the Speaker of the House decided to kill it by sending it to the Rules Committee, from which it was never heard again. <laughs> so, Despite the trend toward finding more and more secular seeming forms of creationism to balance the teaching of evolution, creationists have enjoyed no real successes here. And it seems that, to these uh, apes' consternation, intelligent design has got to be the end of the line. If intelligent design is the view that somewhere at some point in time some intelligent agent had somehow did something for some reason to affect the history of life somehow, it's hard to see how to make it any less specific and more vague than that. And that's why we're now entering, in fact have been entering for about the last 10 years, the third phase of anti-evolutionism in the United States, in which it no longer being possible to establish formal policies banning or balancing the teaching of evolution, here we go again. Since I've already proven I'm willing to interrupt for tech problems, I want to check uh, yes. that Since Wait so. Okay, I don't know why it's not coming through your, your speaker in the back. I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right. The third phase of anti-evolution in the United States is when we're tr the creationists are trying merely to belittle uh, evolution. Obviously, if you have banning and balancing, you need a third verb beginning with B. Belittling is fine. Of use besmirching, but obviously further research is indicated. Uh, catchphrases associated with these tactics include theory, not fact. Teach the controversy, academic freedom, evidence for and against, strengths and weaknesses, critical analysis, you name it, it's a fertile field. All of these appeal to secular considerations and enlightenment values, but they're being used in the service of a rather darker agenda. Now I want to be clear that I'm not claiming that these by themselves are new catchphrases or that this by itself is a new strategy, clearly not. Take for example, the theory not fact. Now that's cutting edge stuff in New Hampshire, for example, where House Bill 1148 in 2012 called for evolution to be taught as a theory, and moreover to include the theorists, political and ideological viewpoints and their position on the concept of atheism. Uh, this bill was introduced uh, and then, then rejected by committee and then by the full House overwhelmingly. But still, the idea of teaching evolution as a theory or as a theory and not a fact is quite old. Right back here. Here's a report of a theory not fact policy enacted by the California Department of Education in 1925. Enacted, as my friend Nick Motsky likes to say, when men were men, monkeys were monkeys, evolution was banned from the textbooks. No one was pretending that protecting biblical literalism wasn't the key issue, and William Jennings Bryan was barnstorming the country decrying the evils of evolution. But it persists. Here's a disclaimer that in 1995, the Alabama Board of Education demanded be affixed to all the biology textbooks in the state, which explains that any statement about life's origin should be considered a theory, not a fact. This disclaimer has since undergone two revisions, and the current revision is somewhat less noxious than this one. But the problem in any case is that when scientists say that something is a theory, they mean that it's a systematic explanation of a range of natural phenomena. When these legislatures and policymakers say that something is a theory, they mean it's conjectural or speculative, a guess or a hunch. Now, there's a story to be told about why there's this divergence of usage. It's not just that theory is a technical term in science and that differs from its vernacular sense. I've got a page here. Rather, the vernacular usage exploited by creationists goes back to how the 17th century philosopher Francis Bacon was understood by 19th century Protestant theologians in the United States, and how their understanding seeped through modern creationism to people like Henry Morris and his successor Ken Ham, 
who runs Answers in Genesis, now the most important and wealthy young earth creationist ministry in the world. But really, from bacon to ham, there's nothing kosher about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, merely using such catchphrases, and this is actually the point, isn't what's distinctive of the third phase of uh, anti, anti evolution activity in the United States. Rather, it's using such catchphrases in the absence of references to supposed alternatives to evolution, whether biblical creation, creation science, or intelligent design. Creationists have always had phrases like these in their arsenal of arguments aimed at undermining the teaching of evolution. What's new is now they have nothing else, or at least nothing else equally reliable. The Discovery Institute, the institutional headquarters of intelligent design, had in fact seen the writing on the wall and had started backing off intelligent design and moving to, quote, teaching the controversy, end quote, around 2002, three years before the Kitzmiller case, and probably would have preferred intelligent design never go to trial at all. Now, there's been a development even within this third phase of anti-evolutionism from requiring that evolution be belittled to permitting it to be. So take, as an example of the first part of that, a Florida Senate Bill 1854 from 2011 authored by Stephen Wise. This bill would have added to a laundry list of various items in civics and citizenships that schools are supposed to teach in Florida, from like the Declaration of Independence and the contributions of Hispanics to American culture and kindness to animals, Wise would add to this list a thorough presentation and critical analysis of the scientific theory of evolution. Hey, he wants evolution to be taught. It must be a good guy, right? Wrong. Three reasons. First, the state science standards in Florida had recently been revised. They didn't used to use the word evolution, and now they did. And in fact, they had a pretty good treatment of evolution. This came much to the dismay of Florida's creationists. But given that the state science standards now included evolution, that would make this bill redundant. Second reason not to take this guy seriously. Critical analysis of evolution was the title of the rescinded lesson plan in Ohio, which the Board of Education there had pulled after Kitzmiller, knowing that they would be sued under the same theory that they got sued in Kitzmiller. And third, uh, Senator Wise had previously said that what he was going to do with this bill was require the teaching of intelligent design. He said, if you're going to teach evolution, then you have to teach the other side so you can have critical thinking, said he. Well, 1854 died in committee. But as you see, this bill would have required something to be taught, inviting hard questions about what that is, where I can find it, and who's going to pay for it. So more popular than this approach of requiring the belittling of evolution have been approaches that permit the belittling of evolution, most often under the rubric of academic freedom. And there have been about 40 academic freedom bills in the last decade. Take a bill that was passed and enacted in Louisiana in 2008, saying a teacher shall teach the material presented in the standard textbook and thereafter may use supplementary textbooks. Now, that this bill was creationist in intent and origin was quite clear. Although it was introduced by Ben Nevers, it was um, composed and pushed by the state affiliate of Focus on the Family. It singles out evolution as well as the origins of life, global warming, and human cloning for special attention. And it has since been invoked in at least two parishes to support proposals to teach creationism. And it has also been invoked to attack the treatment of evolution in textbooks submitted for state adoption. So it's a creationist still all right, but my point now is that's permissive. It doesn't tell teachers that they have to teach creationism, something to which they might take umbrage. It, in effect, tells them that they may. And a similar bill passed in Tennessee in 2012. Are teachers listening to this? Yes. And that brings me to the really important point about evolution education in the United States. It's local. It's really local. How local? This rather spider-webby map shows the boundaries of the school districts in the lower 48 states with over 15,000 local school districts, each with a degree of autonomy over cur curriculum and instruction, there are constant opportunities for creationists to try to make progress. So that's why creationism never really goes away in the United States. In contrast, creationists have never been able to make significant headway in developed countries where curriculum and instruction is formulated at the state or provincial level, like Canada, 
or at the national level, such as France. And that even holds true for countries where there isn't such a developed tradition of church-state separation as ours, even in countries where there's a state church. I can back up the generalization to some extent. Here's the developed world. This graph shows the rate of evolution acceptance in 34 developed countries. Um, people were asked whether, quote, human beings as we know them developed from earlier species of animals. True, false, unsure. The blue bar shows the response of true, the mustard bar, not sure, the red bar, false. As you see at the top, the level of acceptance of evolution in Iceland and Denmark and Sweden is well into the three quarters range. The United States is second to last. We were beaten by such scientific powerhouses as Cyprus and Malta. <laughs> at least we beat out Turkey. And still, by any plausible measure, we have a lot more controversy over the teaching of evolution than anywhere else, even if you control for the prevalence of religion in our society, and that has to be attributed to our decentralized educational system. Back home in the United States, individual teachers are not unconstrained. They answer to their departments, their principals, their district administration, and local school districts are not unconstrained. They are subject to the loose, if increasing, guidance of state science standards, um, their state Department of Education, the State Board of Education, ultimately the democratic control of the people through the legislature. There's a new set of, mo of model state science standards called Next Generation Science Standards, which treat, treat evolution reasonably well, and their adoption so far in 12 states will help to make education more uniform across the United States. But the decentralization of American education is, I think, the reason that the evolution wars have been raging so fiercely and so long in our country. And that's why attacks on evolution education are going to continue. Nobody can possibly keep their eye on every school district. In many US classes, as the New York Time, Times remind us, evolution takes a back seat. Origins of species, in many schools, the dog ate that chapter. <laughs> Anecdotes and impressions are rife, but you know, if you really want to know what's going on, you need to study. And the first really good study, a rigorous national survey of high school biology teachers was conducted in 2006. And the results were really kind of shocking. 13% of public school, bio, public school high school biology teachers are presenting creationism as scientifically credible in their classes. More than one in eight. Supreme Court or no Supreme Court. 2% are admitting evolution altogether, or at least admitting it to the survey researchers. 17% are omitting human evolution altogether. And no less than 60% fail to present evolution forthrightly in the ways that the nation's leading scientific and science education organizations recommend. But in another way, a student has about a two in five chance of learning evolution the way he or she should. I don't like those odds. Uh, no wonder that in a recent column, these, the, the researchers who did this work um, argue the cautious 60% may play a far more important role in hindering scientific literacy of the United States than the smaller number of explicit creationists. So even when there aren't headlines, even when the evolution wars aren't explicitly raging, children are still often not receiving an adequate bio biology and adequate science education in the public schools of this country. Since in the famous words of the geneticist Theodosia Stobchansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Helping individuals and communities deal with threats to evolution education is what keeps me busy at my day job at the National Center for Science Education, the only national organization wholly dedicated to defending the integrity of science education against ideological assault. So it makes a nice change to come out to talk to you today. Thank you. Do we do questions or? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, wow. It just seems like, I mean, I hear a lot about the dumbing down of America and Americans, and it just seems like this is part of that. Well, uh, certainly, um, creationist, the creationist activity does help to dumb everything down. Um, but I'm, on the other hand, I wouldn't say that you know, they form a unified block and are working hand in hand, in hand with other forces of dumbing down. So um, there's probably some overlap between uh, anti-vaccination advocates and creationists 
there's a certain amount of overlap between climate change deniers and creationists, but they don't, they don't coordinate and they don't go to the same conferences. And in some cases, there are surprising differences. Yes, sir. In the survey taken of the biology teachers, was there any uh, discrimination between uh, teaching basic uh, biology and advanced placement biology? I don't <coughs> remember whether they actually separated that out. They're certainly looking at people who taught both, um, but I don't recall whether they did so. Uh, they did write a book about this, a rather good book that came out from Cambridge University Press, which has a whole lot of details and lots of statistical analysis. The authors are uh, Michael Berkman and Eric Plutzer. It's a very good book. Uh, yes, sir. I noticed you didn't touch upon a frightening growing movement, homeschooling. Yeah, well, <laughs> homeschooling is, is very interesting. I, I personally get oh, about two or three emails a year from someone saying, I'm a homeschooler, I want to teach my kids evolution, all of the homeschool material I find is creationist, what can I do? And to which my answer tends to be, I don't know, I don't know the homeschooling material. Now, all of the homeschoolers who are happy with the creationist material, of course, are not getting in touch with me. Um, I do not think that there are really good figures on how many people are homeschooling because they want to teach creationism rather than evolution. Uh, I do know that like one of the top three reasons people cite for homeschooling is in order to have religious content in general. Um, and something like about one and a half percent of school-aged children in the country are homeschooled. So on the one hand, it's a concern for NCSC that um, the quality of evolution education and homeschooling environments is so low. On the other hand, we don't really have the, a legal stick to, to beat them with because you know, you're allowed to do that under current law. And the, the number of people who homeschool and who would be receptive to getting good evolution curriculum is so small that it doesn't seem a good use of our resources to do a lot of outreach to them. I agree it's a problem. I don't know what to do about it. Yes, sir. Probably a good time for me to pipe in. Um, I know some people who know me, I homeschool my kids, but um, I'm atheist. And um, there's a lot of people who are homeschooling, and more and more um, people who are coming into homeschooling are not liking the curriculum at the public school. Of course, I do not homeschool my kid because of religious reasons. Um, actually, I think that it's important for the kids to get a balance of all religions theistic and non-theistic religions, um, and secular and so forth. Um, and there are several sources of um, secular curriculums out there, Real Science for Kids, um, Real Science Odysseys, a whole bunch that help us to be able to create that um, evolutionary um, backbone. Um, I also this year have um, acquired two other kids. Um, why did I do it? I don't know. but. I have two other kids who I homeschool um, who are religious, but um, yesterday we were at uh, the body um, exhibit in Buena Park, went through the whole exhibit, and they kind of, the other kids were like, oh my gosh, the, you know, the baby's dead, you know, and they have a whole progression of, you know, the zygote and goes all the way up. Said, no, 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 they're just not living. This is great. I mean, you can't normally see, like, what's inside the body when a, um, a mother's pregnant. So, you know, there's a kind of a, my job is not to change their point of view, to just open up their world. And um, we do not have <coughs> enough information, like you said, to be able to speculate, you know, um, um, whether um, the homeschooling movement is going to um, become a real problem. My, from being in this underground world, and it is a huge underground movement, huge, that doesn't have enough data. There are so many people I connect with who are atheists, agnostic, secular, spiritual, what have you, but then there's the other side too. But um, there's also a lot of people who are religious who really want their kids to have a really good understanding of how to educate across the board. So um, this is part of my role um, as I've started to uh, write books on um, bringing the atheist component out and also a homeschool adventure. I think this is something that I might Want to connect with you later about yeah. Is Real Science for Kids uh, Rebecca Keller? It is. We should talk. Yeah. yeah. One of the big catchphrases in education today, based on a nationalistic 
desire for competitiveness on a global level is STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. What is MCSE doing to align itself to uh, protect STEM from being thwarted uh, with creation? Uh, two inches deep, my own what? Uh, sorry, two inches wide, mile deep. So we don't think about STEM as such because we're really, really focused on evolution and climate change. So, um, you know, STEM is a good thing, but we're looking at tiny, tiny little bits of it and we're, we're focused on them. So. I just think there would be money, there, there's funding in, the, in those places and uh, it can also be a place where they inject uh, creationism yeah. just money there. Well, the creationists are happy to uh, inject creationism wherever they can. And normally, you know, it's going to be a biology class, but there is a incident in Ohio recently where it was archery. <laughs> okay, there's a local ministry that comes in, does archery in the PE classes, because they have a lot of bows and arrows, I guess, and targets, and also teaching creationism at the same time. So, um, uh, so, you know, we do pay attention to STEM, we talk to STEM people, but we're kind of not a STEM organization because that would be a lot broader than we're comfortable doing. And we, we do a couple of things, and we do them really, really well, and we'll have to let other people handle the other issues. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, do you know how the Common Core treats evolution? Well, Common Core is a set of uh, model state standards for mathematics and English language. Oh, they have so, so they say very little about evolution. Now there's something that's kind of like Common Core in that it's a model set of national standards, uh, state-driven as Common Core is. Uh, it's not called Common Core, it's called Next Generation Science Standards. Um, a lot of the anti-Common Core people kind of lump them together. And in Ohio, for example, there's active legislation that would both repeal Ohio's acceptance of Common Core and put crypto creationist language into the science standards. So it's a package deal as far as they're concerned. Now next generation science standards, which you can kind of think of as Common Core science standards except for the name, um, they do talk about evolution. It's one of the unifying ideas. Uh, it's not bad. There isn't nearly enough history of life in it. There's no human evolution in it. But there is the scaffolding on which a teacher could do history of life and do human evolution. So um, California is one of 12 states so far to accept um, uh, next generation science standards. Uh, I have a 13 year old um, who is already avidly reading all the evolution and get his hands on anyhow, so yeah, I got mine. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, but, sorry, my memory's a little fuzzy, but I, I did see an article re online recently that correlated, I forget if it was actually teaching evolution or religiosity as a, as a whole, with the, the number of patents granted in a, in a given uh, region. Have you seen any studies that show an impact on you know, scientific and technical aptitude, you know, correlating it with you know, the teaching of you know, you know, this stuff? Yeah, I, I did see this new study that, that correlated um, um, evolution acceptance and patents, um, which I'm not tremendously impressed by because you know, you can get patents for very trivial things, and it's not clearly a good marker of, you know, scientific fertility. Um, but what about, you know, technical yeah. aptitude and yeah. scientific aptitude? So th there, are, there are some kind of weak correlations. Uh, there are reasonably good correlations between level of education and acceptance of evolution. That's, that's pretty much a robust result you'll see everywhere. There aren't really a lot of accepted metrics in the social science um, literature for you know the scientific productivity of an area. I mean, looking at patents is kind of a stab at doing that, but I don't know of anything that's really very convincing on this. So I, I think that's kind of wide open as a research area. Um, you showed us a chart of different countries comparing the United States as far as the acceptance of evolution. Sure. Have there been any studies done um, state by state within the United States? In other words, how does California rank um, compared to the other states? So that's a, that's a very good question. Um, there have been some. There, there's some st statistical problems here, right? If you are doing a survey like this, 
If you want a margin of error around 3%, which you typically do, then you need a sample size around 1,000. And that means if you want to do a statistically good survey for the United States, you have to do 50,000 to get at the state level. And that's a big, big expensive survey to do. Now, there are actually statistical tricks you can do. The currently popular one is something called Mr. P, which sounds like a soft drink rather than a statistical method, but I don't know. Um, and the answer is, yeah, you can, even with a smaller data set, you can coax out some interesting results. Um, as you might expect, uh, the Pacific Coast and the Northeast do pretty well for evolution acceptance and then it gets steadily worse as you move toward the um, southeast United States in both directions. Yeah. Do these creationist organizations take a stand uh, on uh, global warming denial? Um, some do, some don't. Um, Answers in Genesis and the Discovery Institute are at any rate fairly, um, they're not very much invested in denial, but they certainly have shown sympathies towards denial. I think other ones have been kind of neutral. I don't know of ones that have come out forthrightly and said climate change is happening, it's a real problem. Confusing the matter is that a lot of Christian environmental groups sometimes refer to themselves as do involved in creation care or creation stewardship. And, you know, that's fine. It's, um, that's not the creation of creationist. Uh, yeah, if you're a Republican, you're more likely to reject evolution than if you're a Democrat. That's that's a pretty robust result. Uh, say from survey from survey. Well, thank you, Glenn, very much. I very much appreciate it.